Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the Bush Center for Faith and Culture event. Um, we had uh, such interest that we were not going to be able to fit everyone into the Bush Center lecture hall, so we're so glad to be able to use the Ledford Center uh, this afternoon. Today, we welcome Ross Douthit as our guest speaker. Uh, Ross is a New York Times op-ed columnist, in fact, the youngest uh, columnist for uh, the New York Times. He writes about politics, religion, moral values, and higher education. His columns appear each Wednesday and Sunday. He's also a National Review film critic. He's author of several critically acclaimed books, including uh, this one that I shamelessly uh, had him sign for me just a little while ago, uh, Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics. This is the first time I became familiar with the writings of Ross Douthat and uh, enjoyed what I read that I knew if I had the opportunity to have him here, we would do so. And I want to thank Todd Van Helms, uh, Von Helms and uh, St. David's for um, uh, making it available to where we could have Ross to be with us. And so I'm very thankful for that. He's also the author of Grand New Party, Privilege, Harvard, and the Education of the Ruling Class, and To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism. Ross is a graduate of Harvard University. He's appeared on CNN, Fox News, and various other nationally syndicated programs. Uh, he lives in New Haven, Connecticut, with his wife and three children, ages seven to two. And, and um, he is going to speak to us this afternoon on One Country, Three Faiths, America's Real Religious Landscape. Would you join me in welcoming Ross Douthat? Um, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. Thank you guys all for coming today. Thank you for letting me wear the Garth Brooks headset, which is really, really exciting um, and will carry me through, you know, several songs before the talk actually starts. Um, so I'm going to try and talk a little bit about um, how basically I see America's religious landscape today, uh, maybe a slightly different way of thinking about it from the way that People usually analyze religious divisions in the, in the US. Um, and I'm going to talk about it, I hope, in a way that's somewhat relevant to the work that a lot of you guys are doing or thinking about doing with your lives in ministry in the future. Um, but first, whenever I talk about religion in the US, I like to start out um, with a little bit of uh, sort of personal testimony, because it's good to give people a sense of sort of my own religious background and where I'm coming from and how that shapes sort of how I think about religion and the culture writ large. Um, so I live in New Haven, Connecticut now. We've sort of ended up back there after a long time in Washington, D.C. Um, and I grew up there in southern Connecticut uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. And my parents were both Ivy League graduates. Um, my dad was a lawyer. Uh, and we had, you know, if you looked at our family in sort of sociological terms, we were kind of lukewarm Episcopalians living in the Northeast with sort of f both parents with fancy degrees. And you would have said, this is a family sort of trending towards secularization, basically. You would have said, all right, you know, the family right now goes to church 40 or 50% of the time. They'll probably drift a little bit um, as they get older. Um, my generation would then be Christmas and Easter Episcopalians, and then, you know, in the sort of trajectory of a big part of mainline Protestantism, sort of pass out of organized Christianity entirely. Um, and a lot of things about my background and education, the schools I went to in New Haven, sort of private, pretty secular, pretty politically liberal schools, the sort of whole climate of the Northeast would have sort of confirmed that trajectory. Um, but in fact, that isn't what ended up happening to us. Um, and it, things went in a different direction, mostly because my mother, uh, when I was young, was ill, was sort of chronically ill with a bunch of strange ailments, allergies, chemical sensitivities, arthritis, phlebitis, that um, at the time, and to some extent still now, doctors didn't really know what to do about. Um, and so we ended up, as people who are chronically ill doing, trying a lot of weird stuff, basically, to try and make my mom feel better. Um, and this sort of took us out of the nice, secular, liberal mainstream in a lot of different ways. 
Um, it took us into the world of health food, basically, long before Whole Foods made health food this sort of upper bourgeois luxury good. Um, we would go off to like the weird organic grocery store run by the aging hippie, and you know he'd sort of shuffle out of the back in the tie-dyed shirt um, and the Grateful Dead uh, bumper stickers in the back, and and you would you would buy tofu by what seemed to me like the ton. You know, instead of like a little bit of tofu on your salad or your sandwich, you'd get these huge white blocks that would sit in this sort of disgusting whitish water and be hauled out with tongs, sort of like I imagine people used to haul ice out of New England ponds in the 19th century to ship it around the world. I still to this day don't really eat tofu uh, because of those traumatic childhood experiences. But the world of health food was also, in its own way, kind of a weird religious world, which we weren't really part of because we were still sort of lukewarmly Christian at that point. But, you know, you would go out to eat at the vegetarian restaurant and there would always be a New Age bookstore attached to it where you would go in and there would be the crystals and, you know, the herbs for healing and there would be a long section of books that would have one or two works of Christian mysticism, a little, you know, St. John of the Cross or something up there. Um, and then row after row of titles with, like, women who run with the wolves. Um, this sort of, you know, post-60s Californian eco-Wiccan spirituality. Um, so that was sort of one quasi-religious experience I had. But then the main one came about because of a different weird thing that my mother did. She had a friend who said, well, you know, you're, you're sick and you can't get better. Why don't you come with me to a charismatic healing service? Uh, there was a woman with the literal name of Grace uh, who had had, I think, a near-death experience of some kind and come back from it. It was sort of a religious conversion, but it also seemed to imbue her with some kind of charismatic gift. And so she ran a ministry that would meet in high school auditoriums in southern Connecticut. I still wonder about some of the separation of church and state issues involved in hosting those services, but it would be in a big auditorium and she would have a band and they would sing praise music and then she would walk around the auditorium and point to people in the aisles and identify their ailments and call them out and pray over them. And my mother, of course, thought this was the most bizarre thing she could possibly imagine and she was sitting there feeling very uncomfortable and waiting for it to be over. And naturally, this woman, Grace, pointed to her and identified some pain that she was feeling and she very reluctantly got up and stood in the aisle and let Grace pray over her. And then, boom, she went out in the spirit and fell down on a carpeted floor much like this one and lay there for like 45 minutes or an hour having an intense, life-changing religious experience. And that experience changed my whole family's experience. Um, basically, from that point on, we sort of maintain some connection to the Episcopal Church. Um, we would often look for sort of renewed or sort of renewal-oriented Episcopalian congregations to attend. But then a lot of our time was spent first with this particular ministry and then in the larger world of uh, charismatic Pentecostalist uh, and evangelical Christianity. So we, you know, at one point drove all the way to Toronto where there was this sort of Pentecostalist outpouring of the Holy Spirit at a place called the Airport Vineyard, which is a vineyard church literally next to the Toronto airport in this sort of low-slung strip mall building. And my 13-year-old self sort of stood in the back, probably a room like this one, sort of in the back awkwardly watching as all these grown-ups, you know, passed the Holy Spirit to each other and roared like lions and ran around the room and did a lot of uh, <clears throat> slightly undignified stuff that an awkward teenager was a little bit weirded out by because I was not, I was a, more of a spectator. I was not having the experiences my parents and especially my mother were. But so that meant that basically my childhood was this kind of weird double life where during the week I went to my nice secular liberal private schools and had my nice secular liberal sort of meritocratic education where the goal was to get into the Ivy League yourself and go on to whatever sort of elite career awaited you. And then on the weekends I went and watched my parents speak in tongues. Um, and just to complete the whole arc of weirdness, the magical mystery tour of American Christianity, when I was about 16, we ended up converting as a family to Roman Catholicism. So we were never Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, but with those exceptions, we covered most of the range um, of American, American religion between the time I was about six and the time I was 16.
Um, so that's sort of a quick summary of my own background and the kind of religious experiences and influences that I then carried with me into my career as a mostly political journalist with a sideline in writing about religion. Um, and one of the things, uh, you know, I think one of the defining features of how people in my profession, especially from places like Washington and New York, cover American religion is that we try and impose political categories on it, basically. We say, well, we're comfortable with our usual binaries, Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative. And so we try and explain and understand religion by either imposing those binaries on it or finding similar binaries that work. And so you get the religious left against the religious right or the religious right against the secular left or the new atheists who were big when I was starting out in journalism against traditional believers and so on. And a ton of the coverage that I read and some of the coverage that I wrote um, of sort of religion and culture war in America fell into that category. And you know those analyses can be useful um, but at the same time, my own childhood experiences from the New Age bookstores through the charismatic healing services and everything else, none of that sort of fit neatly into those kind of binaries. A lot of it was sort of untouched or barely touched by politics and ideology and these sort of big national clashes. And a lot of it was just more weird and complicated and sort of distinctive and individualistic in certain ways um, than the story of left and right just sort of clashing. Um, and so a certain amount of the writing I've done about religion, including the book that um, my host was kind enough to plug, available on Amazon.com and wherever excellent books are sold, <laughs> writers are desperate people and I apologize, um, is to sort of try and complicate those kind of binaries. Uh, and so I'm gonna try and sketch you know, instead of a binary, I'm gonna really blow your minds and offer not two, but three groups um, that a, a sort of tripartite division of American religion that I think is a little more nuanced than those sort of right-left distinctions and that helps explain sort of where we are as a culture um, today. And one of the arguments that I, I make in that book and have made elsewhere is that 50 or 60 years ago, it was possible to look at American culture and say that there was a basically sort of traditional-ish, conservative-ish Christian center, a kind of Christian religious center um, to religious culture in the US. And if you look back at the 1940s and 1950s, in certain ways the last big Christian revival in the US, you can see a kind of convergence in that era between figures from different Christian traditions who sort of found a lot of common ground and sort of argued with each other but dialogued with one another and had a lot of theological and moral premises in common. And so representative figures from that era would range from you know, from may, the world of mainline Protestantism, a theologian like Reinhold Niebuhr, to you know, the world of Roman Catholicism, a figure like Fulton Sheen, the famous bishop who basically ran a kind of you know, Dr. Phil style television and radio show in full pre-Vatican II regalia, except it was a much more theologically rich form of religious television than what Dr. Phil is selling. Um, so you have a Sheen and a Niebuhr, and then you have a figure like Billy Graham, who's sort of proving in the 1950s that you can take evangelicalism sort of out of what was seen as the fundamentalist ghetto and bring it to Chicago and New York City, bring it to the secular city and find a willing audience, win positive media coverage, you know, sort of redefine evangelicalism as something that can be sort of modern and mainstream rather than sort of, you know, backwoods and isolated or something. And then finally you have a figure like Martin Luther King who basically takes sort of the black church, the African-American experience from the sort of often persecuted sidelines of American life and uses a kind of religious message to push for social change in a way that ends up sort of carrying the day in various ways precisely because it could draw on this Christian common ground. If you read something like King's letter from Birmingham jail today, what's striking is how many different pieces of the Christian tradition he's sort of pulling in. He's pulling in Reformation figures, he's pulling in medieval Catholics, he's pulling in Augustine to make this case for civil rights to an audience of mostly white Protestant pastors who he's writing for. And I, I feel like that document uh, as much as Graham's rallies or Niebuhr on the cover of Time magazine or Sheen in prime time sort of distills the old religious center um, in American life. 
Today, I think that religious center is gone and we have a somewhat different religious center. Um, so I'm gonna talk about sort of the, the three groups uh, and I, I won't start with the center. Um, I'll start with one of the flanks, basically. So the first religious, I won't call it a tradition, but the first religious tendency, the first powerful religious world picture in America right now is what I'll call, and this sounds a little bit like a contradiction in terms, the secular world picture. Um, this is the world picture of, you know, a lot of the people I went to school with growing up. It's the world picture that dominates in most elite academic institutions. It's the world picture of a lot of people who write for the New York Times. It's certainly the world picture of most of the people who work in Silicon Valley. It doesn't have huge numbers, but it has tremendous influence. So what is that world picture? Well, it includes sort of militant atheists. It includes like the Richard Dawkinses and the people who are very anti-religion. But in its heart, it's not really anti-religious. It's just deeply skeptical of historical institutional religious traditions and very skeptical of anything that seems too supernatural, anything that requires a sort of activist god or anything like that. Um, it likes religion insofar as it thinks religion can advance sort of progressive political goals, so it admires the social gospel of the 19th century, it admires the civil rights movement, and it's interested in religion insofar as it seems to offer something that can be scientifically validated. So to the extent that you can do brain scans on someone who's meditating and pick up how their brain changes and so on, well, that makes, that makes meditation cool and interesting. You know, to, to, to the extent that sort of re different religious traditions seem to have some scientifically grounded therapeutic use in ordinary life, the sexual, uh, sex, <laughs> Freudian slip, the secular world picture is totally, is totally on board with them. Um, but at its heart, the secular world picture basically has a, is trying to hold two fundamentally pretty contradictory ideas together. It wants to hold together, on the one hand, a sort of hard Darwinian, highly materialistic account of the cosmos, in which the scientific method is the only sure source of knowledge, and anything that can't be scientifically validated probably isn't true, and, you know, atoms and neurons and so on are really all there is, and certainly the supernatural is excluded. It holds together that view with an intensely moralistic account of human rights, human dignity, um, you know, the purpose of politics, the arc of history, all of the stuff that you hear frequently in, you know, liberal and progressive rhetoric um, in politics today. So it basically wants to keep it's basically the Protestant mainline without the Protestantism. Um, it wants to sort of keep the old social gospel intact, expand it to a new range of liberal causes, environmental gay rights, and so on, what, without having to go in for any supernatural or metaphysical claims while maintaining this sort of very materialistic conception of the cosmos. And that's a kind of, I think, a real sort of intellectual tension. The metaphysical picture doesn't match up with the strident moralism. And it's a source, in certain ways, of potential weakness for the secular world picture. But I think people are willing to live with that tension in part because they look back at 20th century history and say, well, we sort of went fully post-Christian for a while in the Western world. We went fully post-Christian with, you know, communism and fascism and so on, with these sort of utopian ideologies. And we really didn't like how that ended up. So we're gonna retreat back to a basically Christian world picture, or moral picture, a basically Christian idea about you know, the dignity of the individual and individual rights and so on. And we're gonna hold that somehow in tension with this sort of hard Darwinian view of the cosmos. And we aren't gonna care that it doesn't fully make sense because we're scared of the alternatives. Um, we don't wanna to return to traditional religion, it seems superstitious and ridiculous, but we also don't wanna push on back towards sort of secular utopianisms because we didn't like where they ended up. So that's the secular world picture. Then the second world picture is the real religious center today, and this is what I'll call the spiritual world picture. It's a world picture that, like the secular world picture, is skeptical of too much institutional religion, it's skeptical of you know, traditional authority in all its various forms, but unlike the secular world picture, it's totally down with the idea of an activist god or goddess, 
I, it's totally down with the idea of the supernatural, of angels, of prayer that works, of an afterlife, of a providence that intervenes in human affairs, all the rest of it. It just, it just sort of turns those ideas to extremely individualistic ends. And it basically says that the point of religious practice is not to find the one true God or the one true church and serve him or it. It is to bring your life in harmony with the God within, with the spark of the divine within yourself. And that harmony is the goal of any religious quest. Um, and you, so you don't need to submit to any outside authority. The only authority that really matters is the one inside of you. And the spiritual world picture, I'm, I would... I, it, I'm painting with an extremely broad brush here because I think it covers a lot of different manifestations of religion. I think it has sort of red state versions and blue state versions. You can think of a figure like Joel Osteen and certain styles of prosperity and health and wealth preaching as kind of the red state version. And then the church of Oprah Winfrey um, and the people, the sort of, you know, um, the sort of spiritual entrepreneurs who fall into her orbit and who go on her sort of spiritual awakening tours, that's sort of the blue state version. It cuts across racial lines, interestingly, in a way that a lot of other religious traditions don't. You have a lot of sort of interesting commonality between, especially, again, with sort of health and wealth theology between black and Hispanic churches and some middle American white churches. It includes pieces of evangelicalism. Some of the kind of seeker sensitive mega churches, I think, fall into this category. So do pieces of more liberal pieces of my own Catholic church. But then it includes a lot of people who just don't identify with any religion at all, but like mixing and matching a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of Hinduism, some Celtic spirituality, some Druidic chants, um, and, and, and so on. So it, it, covers, it covers a pretty wide range, but I think that core and very American emphasis on sort of the sovereignty of the individual, the perhaps infallibility of the individual that goes back you know, to Ralph Waldo Emerson in certain ways earlier even than him, that's the core idea. And that's, the sort, of, that's sort of the equivalent today of what you know, the convergent points between Graham and Niebuhr and Sheen and Martin Luther King would have been 60 or 70 years ago. It's sort of, to the extent that there's spiritual common ground in the US, it's somewhere between where Joel Osteen and Oprah Winfrey run their ministries. Um, and then the third group is, in certain ways, the heirs of that lost Christian center, right? And again, there's no perfect term for this third group. I tend to call it the biblical worldview, even though I think you have to say it now, it encompasses Orthodox Jews and observant Muslims and other groups that don't regard the Bible as the Bible the way Christians do. But basically, the third category is people who, who still believe in authority, basically, who still believe in the idea that at the end of your religious quest should be membership in a community that makes particular demands on you, um, submission to, you know, sola scriptura, if you're a Protestant, to the magisterium of the church, if you're a Catholic, um, basically, and that, you know, and that Co coexistent with that is the idea that you can't fully trust yourself, that the God within, the spark of the divine within you needs to be constantly tested against hundreds or thousands of years of religious tradition, against the Ten Commandments, against the Catechism, against some source that can let you say, well, is this impulse I'm feeling right now really from God, or is it original sin at work in my heart leading my desires astray? Um, and that that biblical perspective, I think, has been losing ground. It lost ground in a big way in the 60s and 70s, um, and then it has lost ground again in certain ways in the last 10 or 15 years. It's lost ground because of the sexual revolution in sort of obvious ways. It's lost ground, um, I think, because our society is so just wealthy, and a wealthy, prosperous society where material want and death itself all seem far away, leads people to become much more confident in their own sort of religious capacities and to sort of depend less on tradition and authority in the past and so on. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's lost ground also because of partisan polarization, where you've ended up in a landscape where people's identity are controlled more by their political tribe than by their religious 
congregation or their religious denomination. People define as a conservative first and a Christian second or as a liberal first and a liberal second. Um, and so the biblical perspective has ended up sort of captured by the warring coalitions. And you have a big chunk of it, obviously, in the Republican coalition, and then you have a smaller chunk, often in black and Hispanic churches, that's in the Democratic coalition, and those two groups don't really communicate with each other very effectively, and neither is that influential. Conservative Christians are more influential in the Republican coalition, but they've ended up in the age of Donald Trump in a sort of transactional relationship where they sort of accept their own marginalization and say, well, we're looking for a tough guy to protect us and protect our liberties, as opposed to where they were under George W. Bush, where there was still this sense that, you know, evangelicals and Catholics can come together and recreate a, a, a Christian center for American culture. That sense, I think, has sort of evaporated over the last 15 years, and there's much more of a sense among sort of in this biblical camp of real cultural marginalization. Um, and I think, you know, one way to think about the difference between the biblical perspective and the spiritual perspective that I like to throw out is to, there's a book um, called Eat, Pray, Love that was also a movie with Julia Roberts that came out this was 10 years ago or so. And this book was huge, it was a huge bestseller. And the author, Elizabeth Gilbert, tells what is in certain ways a very classic sort of conversion narrative. She is unhappy with her sort of secular upper middle class life. She has a sort of dark night of the soul where she realizes that her world isn't bringing her happiness and she sets out on a kind of quest. And the quest takes her first to Italy, which is the eat part of the book, not the pray part. So there's pasta, but no pope, basically, in that part of the book. But then she goes to India for the pray part and has this really intense sort of raw, and to me, as someone who sort of observed these kind of things as a kid, authentic religious experience or set of experiences in an ashram that sort of rocks her and delivers the kind of contact with the divine that she'd been seeking. And then in the third part of the book, she goes on to Bali and meets a handsome Brazilian divorcee and lives happily ever after. And I think it's really interesting to read this sort of spiritual memoir kind of in tandem with Augustine's confessions um, and look at the similarities and the differences, right? They are both, you know, memoirs of spiritual searching, both books written by people who felt restless until I rest in thee in some sense. But the end game of Augustine's book is a kind of submission to Christianity, a sense of like, well, I have, you know, I have found the church and I must submit to it. And the end game of Eat, Pray, Love is I have gotten what I need from spirituality to make me feel happy again, but I'm not going to convert to Hinduism or convert to an Eastern tradition. I'm just going to take parts of that tradition, merge it with my lapsed Protestant background, and, you know, find my soulmate after leaving my husband at the start of the book and live happily ever after. So it's basically as if Augustine had ended the confessions by saying, Christianity seems pretty cool. I'll take some Christianity, merge it with some Manichaean theology, throw in a dash of pagan observance, return to my mistress and my kid, and live happily ever after, which would be a very different story and a very different trajectory for most of Christian history since. Um, but that, I think, is, is Eat, Pray, Love is a sort of spiritual text for our times in that sense. It sort of shows how individualism in religion plays itself out in an individual life with someone who has sincere spiritual aspirations, has real religious experiences, and then takes and does with them something very different than a lot of the spiritual memoirists of the Christian past would have done. Um, so, there are different ways to sort of put this framework into practice when you think about um, American culture. You can think about, you know, you can think about a lot of culture war debates, I think, usefully through this framework. You can sort of see this sort of soft spiritual center as basically sort of deciding who wins and loses different culture war battles, right? So if you look at the debate over same-sex marriage, in hindsight, it was always pretty obvious that a cult culture who's sort of religious center is very individualistic and very focused on getting in touch with your true self and believing that true self to be divine would end up favoring same-sex marriage and dismissing the traditional Christian perspective as sort of cruel and bigoted and so on. So it's not surprising that in that debate the spiritual center sided with the secular worldview against the biblical worldview. It's also not surprising that something like the abortion debate, which pits two sort of absolute 
individual claims, the woman's and the unborn child's against each other, would leave the spiritual center deeply divided and sort of swinging back and forth where when a Republican is president, more people identify as being pro-choice, and when a Democrat is president, more people identify as being pro-life because they don't want to have to decide. They don't want to have to choose one way or the other. And so that debate remains permanently unsettled even in a country that's less Christian than it used to be. And then it also maybe isn't surprising that in religious liberty debates of the kinds we've had a lot of, the winning side is usually the side that can cast itself as the victim, basically. So to the extent a religious liberty debate seems like conservative Christians picking on gay people, the spiritual center will side with gay people. To the extent that it seems like secular elites you know, shutting down, uh, shutting down a baker or a florist because they don't want to participate in a same-sex wedding, the soft spiritual center might sympathize more with the conservative Christian. And either way, there's a kind of, you know, a s sort of a swing back and forth that doesn't actually go that far and leaves some of these debates open in a way that the same-sex marriage debate is kind of closed. Um, so I think you can think about culture war debates in that terms, but then you can also think about sort of the mission of Christians, I think, usefully in terms of this framework, right? Um, because it's possible that the future will just sort of be like the last 20 years, only more accelerated. It may be that, you know, more and more people from the biblical worldview will sort of bleed bleed into the spiritual worldview and people from the spiritual worldview will bleed more into the secular worldview. The biblical world picture will get more and more marginalized. I have some fears that a version of that is happening in Catholicism in the Francis era, that there's sort of a bleed of Catholic identity from the biblical towards the spiritual. Um, you can ask me about that in the Q&A if you want. Um, so that's, that's a scenario. It's also possible that at some point some more sort of comprehensive religious worldview that isn't Christianity will emerge somewhere in between the secular and the spiritual. That, you know, there might be a more overt pantheism, you know, a more overt sort of, you know, embrace of Buddhism, a more overt statement of kind of, you know, some sort of weird neo-paganism that sort of emerges out of this still Christian-ish landscape to become the actual next religion of America. But it's also possible to imagine a world where the biblical perspective makes a kind of comeback. Um, and I think if you think, of, if you think of the sort of mushy spiritual middle as your mission field, um, there are, you know, there's, there's sort of a disadvantage that Christians carry in that miss mission field, which is that lots and lots of people in it feel like they know Christianity and they've sort of rejected it. Or they know Christianity and they are themselves Christians and what's the big deal that their theology is mildly heretical. It's not, you know, this is America, what's, what's the big deal and so on. And so there's, there's sort of a, a hump that you have to get over in talking to people who feel like they already know what you're, what you're going to say. But at the same time, this is a landscape that is not some barren, atheistic wasteland where people don't care about religious questions. This is an intensely religious landscape where you know, people are fascinated with the figure of Jesus of Nazareth and still fascinated with, by the supernatural and might you know, still pray and still believe in an afterlife and all, all of these things. So there's a lot of material for people who see themselves as missionaries, in effect, to work with. And then there's also a kind of sociological opening in certain ways where, you know, I, I think one of the big stories of American life in this age of religious individualism is that individualism leads to, especially over the life cycle, isolation, anomie, disappointment, and loneliness. And you see a lot of this in American communities that have sort of secularized, not again in the Richard Dawkins anti-religion sense of the word, but just in the sense that people are sort of nominally Christian and don't go to church anymore and don't sort of, you know, don't participate in congregational life in the way they used to. And what's taking the place of it, you know, is not secular enlightenment. It is, you know, loneliness, suicidal thoughts, the opioid epidemic, all the other scourges of middle America today. And again, this is only going to get worse as a society that has fewer children and fewer marriages and weaker communities gets older and older and more people are sort of going through the life cycle alone. And that's a place where sort of theology aside, though of course theology enters into this deeply, religious communities and congregations have something to offer, have you know an offer of renewal as a means to not just 
a restored relationship with God, but a restored social and communal life of the kind that America in its sort of Alexis de Tocquevillian history has traditionally manifested and may be in danger of not manifesting anymore. So that's sort of the, that's I think one way to think about the sort of religious center as a mission field. But then it's also, you know, and this is sort of closer to my own work as a New York Times columnist and an occasional um, apostle to uh, <clears throat> an, an elite audience that doesn't really know what to make of some of the things I write. Um, I like to joke, do any of you guys read David Brooks, my colleague at the Times? Yeah, I, I like to joke that, you know, David writes about religion and makes secular readers feel like they should be interested in it, and then I write about religion and remind them why they aren't. <laughs> Um, but hopefully, hopefully I'm doing a little bit more, a little bit more than that. Um, but there, I think, to come back to sort of where, where I started with, you know, when you think about sort of elite secular culture, the world of the academy, um, the world of the mainstream media, um, the world of Silicon Valley, you know, the, it's, it's an incredibly smart and talented group of people whose worldview just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and people sort of know that and sense that. And I think you can see some of that sense in like, you know, the rise of social justice activism on elite campuses, for instance. You can understand that in a lot of ways, but I think a serious Christian should look at that and say, this is a bunch of kids confronted with a sort of sterile, you know, purposeless meritocratic machine who want to remoralize it, who want to, you know, who, they want there to be a purpose to their education. They want it to have a strong, even revolutionary moral dimension, and that is a religious impulse, even if it is manifesting itself in a pretty secular, in certain ways, form of politics. Or something like, you know, if you go to Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley is the most secular place in America, by certain measures. But people in Silicon Valley are obsessed with, you know, immortality, <laughs> transcending the body, um, with the idea that we're all living in a simulation controlled by cosmic engineers and so on. And there too, you know, the sort of the, the inescapability of religious questions and the insufficiency of this sort of sort of Christian ethics combined with atheistic metaphysical premises, like that incoherence leads people to want something else. And so, you know, more than in the landscape of middle America, there's a kind of intellectual um, uh, apostleship that Christians can offer um, where, uh, you know, before you even sort of try and prove that Christianity is true, it has the advantage of more than the secular world picture, just cohering and making a certain amount of sense. Um, so those are sort of a couple ways that I think you could, this picture might be of use in thinking about mission, thinking about discipleship, and thinking about sort of the role that Christians, who are obviously more marginal to American culture than they used to be, um, can play in, you know, writing a different story than the one we've been living through for the last 60 years for the next 50 or 100 years of American religious history. So I'll end there. Thank you all so much for listening.